Welcome to another catch-up episode of the Mind Duck Books podcast, another full-on Czech crew. Joining me is Martin, who just got back from China, and Christina, who just got back from Scotland. I got back from work. I have nothing to talk about. Hello! <laughs> How are you guys? <laughs> Hello, I'm doing fine. I am also fine. It's a nice morning here. I hope you feel very inspired after your travels, and I hope you had loads of time to read books while you were traveling. No, I didn't <laughs> read anything true? while okay. I was traveling. I was, I was <laughs> traveling and experiencing things. And then I got back and I read six of the books of the author that I'll talk about today. Oh no. <laughs> What? <laughs> What? <laughs> <laughs> Damn! I, like, I... Both of you chose a very long series, so you yes. already got half of the series done. That's crazy. I, I like when I'm interested, I read fast. Mm -hmm. It tells me that you have never been very interested in any of the books we talked about in our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> But okay. Sometimes I'll, I I'll have a little. I mean, the the Emperor's a Soul little. thing. Yes, exactly. I finished that yeah. in several hours. I was interested. And... And I was like, no. Was yeah, it that's something we have to talk hours. about? So, yeah, how did you like that? It was fine. <laughs> <laughs> that's it? Yeah. I'm, I'm, like, I'm, to be honest, it was straight after we recorded the, the episode. So, um, this is very much me remembering the impressions that I had. I didn't make notes. So this was episode anything. 45, where we did a catch-up episode, and Martin read it, and he recommended it so well that Christina immediately read it. I, like, <laughs> so now, it wasn't bad, fast forward, but I, it was okay. I didn't feel compelled to read more about the world. Mm. Like mm. it was an interesting idea, but I, again, not very informed right now because I forgot a lot of what I was thinking back then. But I remember thinking that. I wish this, like the mechanism with the, the the thing she was doing with the wall. I wish it was a little bit different and that it had kind of followed through on the premise. But I don't know what I meant by that back then. I just remember thinking it. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. So, like, if you ask me, what do you mean by that? I don't know. I don't know. I don't remember. <laughs> but like, I, I was like, okay, yeah, that's kind of cool, but. So yeah, it didn't leave a lasting impression mm, that much. No, yeah. no, not not really. So, so how about the uh, style of writing? Like, did you like the idea of just having one main character and everything was kind of around her? Um, that that was that did feel particularly different, or or like like from books I've read before. So I don't think I noticed that, like in particular because mm, mm. that yeah you've got omniscient narrators in fiction you've got your uh your yeah. like point of view narrators so i didn't yeah maybe it's just me because uh brendan's works are usually like you have the, the kind of game of thrones kind mm. of thing you have like 20 different characters and 20 different point of views and everybody is like in interlaced with everybody else's story so this is kind of a new thing mm -hmm. for him or like a one of a kind thing for him because he's not usually focused on just one character so i was i was wondering how like somebody else would view that kind of writing it was fine so it was just yeah. normal just just okay <laughs> <laughs> Okay. It was fine. <laughs> Have I just enraged many of your listeners? No, no, no. It's just this uh, ongoing. So for the people who don't know, uh, Brandon Sanderson is a is a huge deal in Martin's and Pablo's world, and almost killed me in my <laughs> opinion. But so we were interested. What's your take on Brandon Sanderson? By yeah. after this book, like it's okay. So so it's to... it's fine. <laughs> yeah. We will have to persuade you to read like Stormlight at one point I, or something. I, I, I something might bigger not. From him. I I don't know. <laughs> uh, I I know you might not. I uh, think, but I I'd think be you'd have what to you say if you read it. really, really sell it. Uh, I and because yeah. I I tried it and it was fine, but and I think I checked out the books and and like the summaries and I'm like, well, hmm, the. 
The thing with the weapons is like, yeah, I'm not sure I want to get invested because it is breaking Martin's heart. You better stop talking. It's not <laughs> just sagging a little bit downer and downer. Like the, I I love to read. I and I read a lot, but the the page number that like that really is a deterrent to me because in in my opinion you can tell a That's good fair. story or like when you and and like you should trust your editor you should you should trust your editor mm. and just like cut down stuff that they tell you to cut well, down yeah, so yeah, yeah, but, but you don't that's, have that's for like normal books yeah, that's for normal books but you can't <laughs> cut down on all the lore <laughs> well, that you want to fit in uh, a whole universe like you have to like he's building whole universe it's not just like one contained like, book that, that's, one that's, contained story it, it's based on taste I like to read about like, like world building and involved worlds but Uh, as it pertains to the story, uh, I don't want to read an encyclopedia of uh, like, oh, this is how the world works. I kind well, of. Well, that's the thing. It's not written like that. It's written like, the... like a story. Do, do it I just need gives to? You the lore. When I read a book, like when it's set in a different world, I want to know, like, okay, do I need to know this information about the world for the story? And and. And if you I, don't, if I, but you might need it for another story that, that comes that later. That needs to be done in another way, like like either just hinted <laughs> at shortly, or in that other story. For me, based on the books I've read so far, okay. that I prefer. So the 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 page numbers really are a deterrent because I was like, yeah, that's kind of long. Is it? Is it? Can it be? all that interesting if he cannot express what he wanted to express in a normal no, 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 no. number. <laughs> oh my God. He's, expressing, oh my he's God. expressing exactly what he wants to express. That is his way of writing. Uh, evolving lore around the universe that is a whole <laughs> series of his book. And the thing is that In the future, we might expect that all of the little details, all of the little things that get thrown in here, and many of them already were like explained and paid off and were intertwined into the other stories that kind of were presented in other books and in uh, other points of view of the characters. And I think this is... Like, you cannot write this in a short book. You cannot write this in, like, a contained story. I I wouldn't want to start, like, a Brandon Sanderson, Stephen Bruce battle. But when I have that for comparison, Bruce books also talk about a complex world. And they give you... They give you enough information that you know what happened in the world that is not relevant to the story itself. It gives you the kind of information that everybody who was in that world would know about, but it lets you figure out what happened on your own. It doesn't state it outright and clearly, not in like the first book. It's just like a little hint in, in this book. And then in the second book, you get told a little bit more about how, like what happened with the world. That, that's exactly what Brendan does as well. <laughs> <laughs> and yet the page count. And yet the page count. <laughs> Because It there's a lot of things to tell, uh, <laughs> you know? I it might, you know, like say, I might eat my words. Admit at least that it's a little excessive, if nothing else. I might eat <laughs> my words, so you know. Much. I might just go back on it when I, when I, if I, if, if I you, read one Christina, of the books, wanna, I might say. If you want to give it like a, yeah. if you want to give it a proper chance, I'm a person who is always open to new things and always trying to give it a fair chance. So I've read the Way of Kings, the first one almost died, but I'm still willing to give it a chance. I'm gonna read the Mistborn first book from the Mistborn series, where Paolo and Martin both said that it's half the uh, size and all the things I complained about are not there. So if you want to yes. join us on that, it's only 500 pages, it's not 1000. <laughs> Maybe. And it's also like a contained story. 
It's, you'll see, you you'll can see. read just the first book. But just a note for the listeners, when Martin was describing Brandon Sanderson and how he likes to write, uh, Christina's expression <laughs> watching him <laughs> was <laughs> completely I... nodding, and of somebody who's watching a victim of an illness that hasn't <laughs> had a cure found for. I, I, I am a bit wary of people, any people, Guilty being put on pedestal. Because I've seen it happen, and I'm always like... It, so it m- makes yeah. me slightly worried for the people who do it. <laughs> I I think that not not all of his work is great, but like, I think the world he's building, like nobody else has built but that good, before. It's good we have different points of view, so that's why we're Writers here. improve yeah, as yeah. they write. That's just the thing. It's not like mm. nobody is born that's true. the yeah. perfect yeah, yeah. genius writer who amazes everyone. He definitely has to be improving and... Based at least on the volume, he has to be improving a lot. <laughs> Maybe he's going to build himself up to be the most amazing writer ever, there's, there's just a by lot the details, sheer volume yeah. of text he's produced. Remember how I said that? I didn't think there was going to be an argument about the book because I didn't remember that much about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. I just uh, wanted to catch up on that because this is a catch-up episode after all. Yeah. Have you been reading anything... Other than Brandon Sanderson, Martin? <laughs> uh, I've been... Well, let me see. I've read Down Chart, which is Brandon's book, between the third and the fourth Stormlight, and I started reading the fourth Stormlight. But <laughs> That's a hard no <laughs> for the listeners. Uh, other than that, I've been rereading the Dresden Files for today's oh, episode. And... Yeah, that's about it. I, I guess. No, right. no, I'm just I guess not. Curious. I guess I only read Sanderson. <laughs> yeah, I get it's, it. I it's get like it. my comfort. Comfort. Everybody food. has like a comfort writer. I feel like. As I said, each of us has a book. So I've looked up some info about the Dresden Files uh, series. Seventeen books, reasonable yep. lengths, about three four hundred pages, written by Jim Butcher, who looks like a buff wizard. Have you seen his photo? (laughs) Yes, it's a very cool photo. (laughs) I'll post the photo into our chat. Leather, wizard, jacket, beard, blue hair. The blue hair is a style. I'm more puzzled by the jacket. What's that thing on the shoulder? Like... That's wizard. Is that wizard. just like, like this, guy lives in his, that's this guy lives in his work? Superfluously. Yeah. <laughs> wizard fashion, excuse like, me. Like yes. I would judge him it's for a that. Modern style the wizard. The, the hair <laughs> looks <laughs> cool, though. I would probably hate curling yeah, it. Yeah, every the coat day. makes him look like a like a falconer or something like that. <laughs> yeah, the the hair adds the wizardry. And has he got like a like a sweatshirt and a. And a shirt underneath mm. with the collar over there. Yeah, the... it's very funny. Yes, it's a very. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's he a does. Very amusing outfit. Yes. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> but I appreciate it. I feel it's very fun. It's like if a writer just you know put on like a half of a wizard cosplay. It is a look. Yeah. <laughs> So he's another one of those who never stops writing. Like, I guess the same is going to go with uh, Christina's book today. I guess. He's written 17 of these books. And in between the installments, like the main books, there are like five each time. There's like, for example, the latest is 17. And already there's been 17.1, 17.2, 17.4, 17.0, whatever. And already announced 18th book. And the parts in between are full-on books or short stories. But... If you count all of them, it's like 40 books already. Damn, who has time to read all this? I don't know who has time to write all this in the, f- in the first place. But since Adam was here last time, right, we've talked about the Wandering Inn. Yeah. And we've talked about the He Who Fights With Monsters. That's, that's, Those yes. are on even higher level than that's this. True. Like 12 million words in the... Yeah, in the... I remember book 8 had like 8,000 word, uh, sorry, pages or some nonsense. So this one is reasonable. But still lots, lots to read. So how many of the series have you read? Only the first two books. Okay. Uh, because, well, we'll get to that later. Why? <laughs> okay. But I've read up on uh, a little bit on what the series is about overall. Uh, and I think I would enjoy it. But yeah, I don't have time to, to read mm. it all. So just to sum up, Jim Butcher is from the US. He's 50 years old now. And he's written a bunch of stuff. But this is the main series he's known for. There was a TV series planned, but it was unfortunately cancelled in 2018. Oh wait, so no, not... there, there was a TV series, I think, at one point. Uh, but from they sci-fi. Didn't, 
Yeah, that's the thing they planned, but it was cancelled. So I don't know if they actually made some episodes and then no, they cancelled it. There was like a, one series, I think, on sci-fi. Oh, uh, they're right. Yeah, Sorry. yeah, yeah. And uh, a lot of people liked it. Oh, never mind. Okay, so it happened, but then it didn't continue. Okay. Yes, I think sci-fi, like sci-fi does, you know, cancels all their shows after like uh, they stop being lucrative. So mm. they just, I think, did one season and cancelled it. Looks fun. Yeah, why not? So that was about the first book. Okay, so so yeah, we should go back to the uh, writers improve with uh, the <laughs> amount they write, right? <laughs> because I think as a disclaimer, this is his first published work. Released in 2000. Yeah, I found out that he wrote this book as a part of an exercise for a writing course oh, in no. 1996. He tried like four years to find a publisher for it. Mm -hmm. And in between that, he wrote three more books out of this series. So he already had like four books prepared. And uh, from what I've read and what I've seen, this series gets much better after the mm. first four books. <laughs> so, so this is the, the kind of thing that you you should read like more than just one book. M more, more than more just, than just two books. Like kind of like... <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah, more than just four more books. Just four. So it kind of breaks my heart because some of these series are like really good, but they always, uh, people are always so put off by the beginning of them. Yeah. So it's almost like writers like go back and rewrite the first one or something. I don't know what should be done about it. Could you start with the fifth book just without reading the others? Just, just you know, you trust that the book will tell you all you need to know about the world and the characters and okay, there will be some inside jokes and references that you're not going to get, but could you start reading the fifth book? I would say yes. At least from first and second book I've read, the books are very episodic. Mm -hmm. You only have like two characters or maybe three characters that are recurring during the mm. stories. So you have the the main character, Harry Dresden, and then uh, his friend slash uh, <laughs> love interest slash uh, enemy slash everything, Murphy. And then we have some smaller characters like, like Bob. I, I can talk about Bob later. Who's Bob? B Bob is but, the best, uh, I assume. <laughs> Bob, Bob is Bob is really yeah, cool. He that's doesn't the way it usually face, is, isn't he's it? He's really cool. Like the side characters. Like, yeah, yeah. Oh, I want to know more about yeah, him. The side characters have the most character. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's usually. Uh, so yeah, I should I guess say uh, if I just started with the second book, I think I could catch on. Uh, there are some minor things about the character development, but I think you can like fill in the gaps. Book five, I don't know, but book book two, yes. So to say what this kind of is, uh, is it urban fantasy or like... So it's dark urban fantasy. Mm -hmm. Also, it has like mystery and noir elements mixed into it. You know, it's modern day Chicago, America, but it has elements of the supernatural thrown into there. So mm -hmm. there, are, there, are, there is magic, there are wizards, there are fairies, there are werewolves, vampires, anything you could find in a fantasy book. Mm -hmm. So Harry Dresden is wizard, private investigator for hire. Hmm. He he advertises himself as the best wizard private investigator for <laughs> hire okay. in the whole United States uh, because he's the only one. <laughs> well, he's the only one who's uh, qualified enough and uh, willing enough to do this kind of work as a business. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of the time he's uh, working as a kind of a consultant or forensics expert for supernatural stuff for the police department. That's where Murphy comes in, the second character. Uh, and she is the chief of the special investigations division, which kind of deals with, the, you know, the special investigation. <laughs> so it's like very serious stuff for a very serious character. Uh, uh, and uh, she deals with all the, like supernatural or like any crime that could be connected with the supernatural. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, she's not a POV character. Does it skip around much or is it kind of linear from his point of view? Uh, it's very linear. Okay. At the beginning, there is a murder. Uh, and I think that's like a typical thing for this series. Yeah. I think at every beginning of the book, it's like there's a murder. Mm -hmm. And Harry is called in and he's there to investigate, like Murphy, you know. She's she's this like stereotypical strong independent woman mm -hmm. that 
obviously has a long history with Dresden, uh, but also it's a kind of a love-hate relationship between them. Yeah, Harry gets called in, he says, oh, okay, it was probably this, probably that, and then immediately he gets thrown into all the shit that happens. It's a really fast-paced series of books yeah. i would say you're at like chapter four and already harry was like kidnapped by the local mafia boss he was visited by this damsel in distress kind of character who's she, she's like very mysterious and very like oh i can't tell you much but i think that my husband has been like murdered uh, and then, then he like uh, probably gets involved in, with vampires and then he gets called in for the investigation so uh, that happens like all at the beginning and then everything becomes more and more complicated as the story progresses and you know the story just doesn't stop and that's kind of fun to read it doesn't really give you th- time to think if you <laughs> if you like if you don't stop reading you just like it just presents you with new and new mm-hmm. stuff is it predictable or do you think you're surprised at points i think it gives enough hints that you can figure out what mm. happened but it's not obvious. It's, okay, okay. It doesn't obviously tell you, like, this happened. It doesn't <laughs> present you, like, you know, in uh, in uh, Colombo, I think Detective Colombo, <laughs> like, there was this, the beginning, there was always, like, the murder happened at the mm-hmm. beginning, and then... Yeah, but that was the Columbo fun. came in and I started liked dealing that with so the... much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You like... got to see Colombo <laughs> it, it was, it was fun. being like, oh, and just one more thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, <laughs> I, I, I love that series as well. Like that's that that was amazing. <laughs> but yeah, this is not that kind of thing. It just tells you mm. the hints, but it doesn't give you the full story until the main character actually solves it. So, for me, it was really fun to read. Sounds like it. But also another disclaimer: it kind of connects to the first one. The writer doesn't really know how to write women at all. <laughs> I was expecting like, this. <laughs> I, I have suspected since. Okay. Like, sent me a v- meme recently. You should say, like all the. I guess it kind of connects to the noir style of the mm. book. Every character in that book is just, uh, you know, sex appeal machine. Uh, you know, <laughs> machine. He, within the fifth chapter, he already met like five mm. women. The only five characters, five women characters in the book. All of them are super hot. All of them are like described by the main character as like he he describes them in in so much detail. When when he sees a male character, he's like, oh, this guy is you know he looks a little scruffy, but he's a good detective. He knows the right from wrong, and he like explains his characteristics and how he like acts, how he behaves. With, with women, it's like there are three paragraphs of she had cool uh, red long hair and a lipstick like shined with bright light and her bosoms were... Uh, and it's, it just goes on. It just <laughs> goes on. Gravity. Like, uh, her yeah, gravity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like this kind yeah. of thing. So are, are there sex scenes in this story or not? Yes. Are they good? Uh, not really. Okay. No, it's, it's I'm not like really... really, really trying to find a book where there are good sex scenes and doesn't exist. There was, <laughs> there was only one on our podcast so far. I'm not sure this episode released at this point or not, but this, we've already covered 60 plus books and there was one where I thought the sex scene wasn't bad. It probably will not, <laughs> okay. you'll probably not find it by male author. In my experience, they, they tend not to write them all that well. Uh, however, yeah. let, you, you spoke about the descriptions of female characters as like paragraphs of their very much focusing on their physical appearance, let, you know, viewing them as sex objects. Let me read you this thing because I think, I think you and your audience <laughs> might not okay. know it and it is fucking hilarious. It's uh, from mm-hmm. a post, like a meme about how male writers write female characters. And I think you might hear the, the author in this text. Cassandra woke up to the rays of the sun streaming through the slats on her blinds, cascading over her naked chest. She stretched, her breasts lifting with her arms as she greeted the sun. She rolled out of the bed and put on a shirt, her nipples prominently showing through the thin pa- fabric. She breasted boobily to the stairs and titted <laughs> downwards. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's, that's the gist of it. Pretty much this. <laughs> Did it? Like, I feel like I've heard this one. I, I feel like, like maybe Adam, Adam been... read it last time. Yes, it's, it's Adam a... has been reading that to us, the exact same thing. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good one, yes. It, it orig- and I think yeah. it's, pretty, uh, it, it's, it's pretty accurate to, to yeah, how yeah, women yeah. But, are but written to be fair, quite often. I think it's... Yeah, I, I think it's not that bad in this, <laughs> this like... one. Like, it, it's definitely a problem mm. in this book, and... To be fair, it's kind of part of the character yeah, because yeah. Harry Dresden, he's seen some shit, but also like, he has as a part of his character this nature of I'm a I'm a gentleman, so I must like be gentleman to other women, and uh, you know I this is my kind of way of being chivalrous. Uh, sh- chival- I, I cannot <laughs> yeah. pronounce that word, but being a knight <laughs> to all the ladies, so I must protect all the ladies, okay. but also my hormones. That's the, my hor- like he's very self-aware. Okay, mm. uh, doesn't sound like so it though. He, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Maybe I'm I'm not doing him a good of just no, that like, good of a justice. I, uh, is he aspirational, or are we are are we the readers meant to kind of look at him looking at women like that and see? Okay, you're an asshole a little bit. Or is it like, oh, he he is a character that we want to be, and we kind of you know, agree I'm with him. The letter. We, d- we the readers. No, uh, like, he is a flawed character, uh, hmm. so uh, you probably don't want to be mm-hmm. this character. Okay. Uh, but uh, you know that he's trying his best as well. Like, he is very calculating in his mind, he is very, like, uh, logical, mm-hmm. uh, and he is not very experienced with women. So You don't say! Uh, it's kind of... Mm. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of his <laughs> way of thinking. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like if this changes significantly and there is pro- some progression in book seventeen, yeah. I've heard, I've heard it's part of his progression. Then in like, that sense, it could ha- be fun. Yeah. Uh, that kind of at the beginning, he's very, very annoying with this thing, and like by book five or six, he's much mm-hmm. better. Mm-hmm. So it's just part of him and who he is. And if you can get over that. Uh, I think you will enjoy this book a lot. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, yeah, it's not a book for you. It's just don't don't read that. We talked about that a very direct comparison was the book uh, Dead Witch Walking that we covered on episode seventeen. But yes. this is much very much like the male side of the story, and uh, Dead Witch Walking was like more of a female point of view. And both of them are very. Like, it's like a breeze to read. It's, it's very relaxing mm. and it's, it's fun. And uh, yeah, I, I think I, I like it. Is there any reason you stopped after the second one, or do you want to pick it up later again? Well, that's the thing. Uh, the I think it's the episodic nature of mm. the books. Uh, from what I know, the books have this pattern that they follow. So it's kind of an episode of a detective series. But the problem is, like with the first book and the second book, the author took it to extreme. I feel like he just took the first book and changed the characters a little mm. bit <laughs> and then like th- th- threw in variables for good measure okay. and and like okay that's a new story uh, thank you goodbye that's I that's see. me i don't know if it's like it probably gets better with each mm-hmm. further book later on in the series but this kind of threw me off because i just i felt like i've read the same yeah, book again i get it just with different characters mm, that sucks so maybe it's fun if you skipped to like book five and so if you actually liked it like you can get into it if you start reading it uh, maybe I, yeah. I actually want to ask you are there book remakes i think sometimes sometimes you might get another edition because mm-hmm. books usually are published in editions based on yeah, how yeah. popular they are and I think some editions have some things maybe changed I know that American Gods by Neil Gaiman uh, mm. there, there are different editions of that and there are some some differences as, as in like he in the le- letter editions he added stuff that he had edited out for the for the first editions mainly because mm. readers were asking for it yeah, yeah. Uh, they wanted more oh, I didn't know 
that might be what you're talking about? I was just uh, thinking about it because we always come to these problems, like they can't write women and it's too long and it's the first few, ep- few, few installments suck and it's all these problems. So why wouldn't it be something like with the movies, like you could have a team instead of one person, mm. you could have a woman on the team. And you could rewrite the first book after you've written 17 of them and you can release it, you know, like on a high standard, high quality standard again and have it like, oh, this is a re-edition, reboot, remake. And we, everybody's like, yeah, this is going to be amazing because this this person has clearly learned how to write so much better. And maybe he could condense 17 books into like a trilogy now mm-hmm. and rewrite it again and make it amazing. Why wouldn't that happen? Like, isn't that a... I think copyright. But if, the, if it's the same person doing it, then there's no problem with copyright. I don't know. I'm not sure if even the the writers would be interested in that. Okay. Uh, it's the kind of thing like you 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 write a book, you spend time with the characters, you finish the book, and unless you're an embarrassment like J.K. Rowling, you don't hmm. want to return to those <laughs> characters and keep squeezing them for more and more money. I see. Uh, True. The reason I'm uh, kind of inclined to this is uh, because Orson Scott Card, which I keep talking about, he uh, was uh, writing the script for the mm-hmm. movie, the uh-huh. Endless Game. And he wrote like a theater script. Uh, it has been at least 20, 30 years since he wrote it, I don't know. And he wrote like a very, very short version of the first book that was supposed to be like the ideal script for the movie, but it ended up being about five hours long, so they didn't use it for the movie. But then he released it as a live reading of the book, and it was amazing. It was like exactly what I described. There was a bunch of people working on it, so they made sure it was well-paced, it was well-written, it was improved, the characters each got better timing and everything. And it was very condensed, and it worked super well, and I loved it so much. And it was like a fifth of the length of the original book, and it was perfect. So I was, at the time, thinking the same, like, why doesn't this happen a little bit? Because clearly the writer has learned so much how to do this, and the book he became famous for is so old. Mm. So if he did it again, it would have been so much better. Uh, So I would be up for it if there were reboots and remakes of books. But I guess you're right that the authors don't want to. <laughs> Maybe it's even like an ego ego thing. I can't redo my mistakes because there were no mistakes. <laughs> it's also like hard to keep the continuity, I think. Mm. Like if you change like the beginning of the story too oh, okay. much, you, you would have, have to discard problems. the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, with the later on stories and like yeah. it wouldn't fit the, the canon. So like the little details would be hard to manage, I would say. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Mm. Yeah. But yeah, I think if I uh, wanted to, I would be up for reading it. It sounds like something I like once in a while just to relax with a, with a fun story. It's good for just nighttime reading when you don't really want to think about things too much. That's a perfect book for this, this mm. kind of ex- escapism. Yes, yes exactly. Yes. Pleasant, comfortable escapism all the mm. way. <laughs> yeah. Nice. <laughs> so let's move on to the next uh, book. Or anything else? Also, yeah, I have to talk about Bob. I s- oh, sorry, <laughs> Tell us Bob, about Bob. Course. Who is Bob? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so a little bit of a, a setup for this. Uh, so Harry Dresden is a wizard, as we know. So he does a lot of wizardy things, but he also has a wizardy problems. And wizards have a problem with modern technology. Uh, as in, it doesn't really work very well around them. So, like, lights break and computers don't work, calculators just give out wrong numbers. So anything that's electronic, anything that's kind of advanced technology, breaks. He's also alchemy nerd or al- alchemy geek, mm-hmm. and he loves to make potions. And uh, let's say Bob is a way for him to pertain information on the various kinds of ways of how to make a perfect potion. Mm. So what would you say a Bob Bob is? (laughs) What is a Bob? (laughs) What is a a Bob? It has to be Uh, something weird. It's going to be like a blob, like an amphibian blob that can swim and transform into fishes and birds and something. It's like a magic creature. (laughs) Some kind of magic deafening creature that has the the abilities to suppress your magic and that way you can be around technology. Ah, okay, that's a good idea. Yeah, yeah, that's a a pretty cool idea. That's not in there. But no. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, 
but it, so, so let's uh, let's let's hint a little bit more. He's like his own personal Wikipedia for potions. Your book? No, not really. Is he like a brain in a jar? <laughs> okay, that's pretty close. <laughs> okay, I'll give you that one. It's a talking skull. Ah, but it's not actually a skull. It's like a spirit of knowledge trapped inside of a skull. That's cool. And he has, or it has, like a perfect memory, so it can remember everything that ever happened to him mm -hmm. and around him. And he's also very old. So mm -hmm. he just knows a lot of things about potions. And he also, for some reason, is uh, very horny all the time. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Which would be a problem for a skull. Yeah, that's a pretty big big problem for a skull. But, but like, he actually isn't the skull. He's just the spirit in the skull. Yeah, and yeah. he's trapped in there. So if Harry allows him to, he oh, no. can... Get oh, out no. of the skull and possess oh, no. him and, and fuck many of, women. Oh no! Possess oh, not no. not him, not him per, oh, no. in, per se, but he he can possess other beings. Oh no! So he just goes <laughs> on like sorority parties or like oh, no. and just like <laughs> has fun there and then comes back uh, after like you know the agreed upon time uh, uh, by Harry. So so he's kind of this. <laughs> <laughs> so he's he's very horny Wikipedia for potions. Oh my god! Yeah, if if the you know if those like scenes were well written, it could be like fun. But sometimes they're so painful, like it's so bad. So yeah, I hope it's, it's not like, that bad. I, I don't want to read about a skull spirit sexually assaulting people. No, yeah, exactly, no, no, yeah. no, 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 it's not there. It's not like on screen. <laughs> like, it's just like... It doesn't matter. It happens. <laughs> You're already it's thinking not, about no, it. It's not in the page. It's not on the pages. It's just... <laughs> it's in your head. It's worse because now you imagine it. <laughs> now you can imagine it in any way. Okay, I see. <laughs> but that sounds actually... The, the character sounds lots of fun. Yeah. That's, that's probably the best character, okay. like you said. <laughs> like, I think that uh, overall, like, the characters... Harry and Murphy are very well fleshed mm -hmm. out characters right from the beginning. The other characters are just like kind of there to progress the story or just to be kind of a, you know, sexual interest for the main character. Mm. And then there's Bob, which is kind of like somewhere in the middle. He's a side character, so he doesn't have much space, but he's also the most fleshed out side character, I would mm -hmm. say. So he's kind of fun mm -hmm. to, to be around. Mm. Yeah. Oh, and also he has a cat. <laughs> called Mister. That's just. Does uh, he possess yeah. the cat? Oh no! Uh, oh no! That's exactly what I didn't want to know. That would be a spoiler, I think. Uh, so oh no! Let's, <laughs> it's gonna let's happen. Not talk about. <laughs> it's gonna happen exactly what you're thinking. Uh, it's nothing like that. It's I nothing should, like that. I should take screenshots of Christina's face and play on the podcast. <laughs> it's because see yeah. cats. I think I've killed it for Christina. See cats. <laughs> yeah. They have like. <laughs> Um, barbs on their penises. That was the reason yeah, for my exactly. face being the, the, being my face. Because I know this. Don't, don't imagine him possessing a duck and such. And, That's and just then, not what it is. Then I, uh, yeah, there's, there's ducks, but hopefully there's no duck in Dresden Files. And I was like, okay. Well, not uh, yet. I don't know. Maybe, maybe eventually. Well... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so would you read it, Christina? Um, so, <laughs> maybe, maybe. Like, like I, I have some experience uh, reading books by male <laughs> authors who describe women more or less competently, more or less as sexual objects. So I, I don't think like if the story was worth it and if the writing style was compelling enough then i would be able to just roll my eyes at the at the manifold <laughs> descriptions of of the soft skin and <laughs> manifold descriptions <laughs> boobily breasting uh, all, all around everywhere but <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it would like the writing style would have to be probably really compelling. Mm, mm. Yeah. All right. So the next book. So My book we or your move book? Move a little bit forward. Your book. My book. So it's called the Book of. 
Jared. Jared. Yeah, I purposefully uh, let okay. you pronounce that. Uh, there is a pronunciation guide in the book. You, I don't think people would really, really need it. It's Jedek. Um, okay, Jedek. Yeah, yeah okay. book of Jedek. And, and the, then the, the guy is Stephen Carl Zoltan Bruce. Yes. Uh, is, is that correct? That is correct. He's got, he's American, born in America, however, uh, Hungarian ancestry. And it shows, mm -hmm. I think, through his writing. Yeah. And um, in a way that I was like, okay, I. this is nice. This is interesting. He's not just... America, fuck yeah, kind of <laughs> guy, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Which is also nice, so she... because, you know, we have yeah. read books like that, and uh, mm -hmm. it gets annoying after a while. Mm -hmm. He's 67, and uh, I'll send a picture. He looks lots of fun. He does. The, the, the real oh, yeah. question is, have you listened to him play the drums? No, but I, I did I, read that he is also a musician. And uh, about his appearance in one of the books, he wrote that he now he wears a hat to hide his bald spot. But he used to wear the hat <laughs> even before he had a bald spot. So it's totally not the reason why he's wearing the hat. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> totally <Busted>. not the reason. <laughs> okay. He's a member of a folk rock band called Laughing. Oh, sorry, Cats Laughing. Cats Laughing. That's a nice Which name. I listened to a bunch today, and it's pretty pretty cool. I like it. I, I think he is a cool it's guy. A, yeah. I... It's a very unusual spin on folk rock because he plays the, this drum in the picture. I don't know what you call this drum. It's it's a it's a, it's a unusual type of drum. I, I'm not a very good drum description is <laughs> <laughs> who is <laughs> but this has, has a very distinct sound that's in all the songs and i think it's very 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 nice so i i approve he's also an avid poker player by the mm -hmm. way i found and uh this is the first book in the vlad taltos series taltos uh, taltos mm -hmm. okay vlad taltos <laughs> and it's in 1933 it was released and it's only 300 pages however 17 books in the series <laughs> yeah yay uh, there is uh there's a lot of books in the series and he wrote other books besides that the the good thing about the about the books is that you don't need to read them in order uh in fact because hmm. they're not the story like the books as they go that is not chronological you start with one oh, book and then the oh, other okay. book it's going to take place maybe a lot further on in the future or even before that other book um cool. so the there's like a question which order should we read the books in you can read them in the chronological order as the story goes or you can read them as they were published however definitely do not start with the book called tekla because that would bum you out <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a, you, right. you need to be a little more invested in the world before you tackle that. Is it because it's like too difficult to consume or is it because it's bad? It's not bad. <laughs> it's just uh, it is very focused on the uh, political situation and the inequalities ah, in the world. And it's it's nice. It would be much nicer for you to like get to know the world and like the world and mm. understand that, that this sense. is yeah. a complex world where there are inequalities before it punches you in the face and the character kind of... Yeah. Speaking of, the, this is the third one in the series, mm -hmm. and on the book cover there is a red giant fist. Yep. Uh, <laughs> so what, uh, what actually brought this author to my attention was a post I saw online where someone talked about how fantasy books and fantasy settings neglect food and the the role food plays in our lives mm. which like imagine you're in a new place china for example and you're walking mm. down the high yeah. street the main road though the the promenade near the sea and there's uh there's restaurants and cafes and street food stalls all around you and you can smell the the meat and the sizzling and the dough mm. baking and and all the spices and the freshly brewed coffee and it really 
informs your idea of the place and how much you enjoy it. It, it just it is very integral to the entire experience. And uh, mm -hmm. the truth is that cities throughout history weren't all that different from right now. And like ancient Rome, that was street food paradise because people like have always liked to eat and to treat themselves to little treats. So if you're interested in finding out what people might have eaten throughout history, there is like an excellent YouTube channel that uh, it's called Tasting History with Max Miller. And the guy oh, yeah, picks yeah, yeah. a recipe from history. And then he tries to make it to the best of his abilities while he also talks about, about it, yeah. uh, like <laughs> something from the era or a story connected to the recipe. And it is very interesting and great. And like this... Also, I use it when I teach English because he's got subtitles and it's interesting. So, mm -hmm. like, yeah, sounds great. if you want to find out how to <laughs> brew Sumerian beer or, uh, mm -hmm. you know, ancient <laughs> Aztec chocolate recipes. Yeah. But, like, <laughs> fantasy worlds, usually there's an inn. And you go and you have an ale or some mead and then mm -hmm. you have some bread. And like, if you're lucky, yeah. you might end up in some lord's castle and there's a feast. But like, I haven't read all fantasy books everywhere. So yeah, the keyword is mm -hmm. usually. Yeah, of course. Uh, it's not very usual. But, but that has been my experience. What, what does Brando Sendo, the great and powerful, uh, do <laughs> in, in his books regarding food and, and eating food? Like Okay, remember Philip the First Stormlight? Uh, oh my where god, there were, it's this time. Uh, expansive scenes Quiz from time. how uh, the noble people of the world... Yes, all uh, I remember their is eating the fucking habits, safe hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, their eating habits, their way of uh, this uh, <laughs> separating what women eat, yes, what male, men yes. eat. It's, really it's very, well, yes. very well portrayed and very but different from... Does it make you no. hungry, though? No, no, no. Mm, well, like, no, not really. I, like, it doesn't, like... They don't it doesn't give you, like, details about what the food actually is yeah, exactly. too much. So they talk it about the food a lot, the... but they don't talk about what the food actually is, which is infuriating. It gives you the lore mm -hmm. about uh, what, like, the food means in the culture, which, like, I... <laughs> okay, I think <laughs> Again, it's important, but... <laughs> <laughs> but also, I, I I see your point there. Like it's uh, it would be actually yeah. nice to have much more details about what the like people of the world actually feel about the food, like how they actually you know interact with it and what what's their yeah, like, and just just like kind the, of enjoyment the, out of this, it. You walk, they're walking down the street and they can smell the food from the or they have a favorite restaurant in the city, right? Like that would be yeah, yeah. extremely yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. natural and human. And sadly, it doesn't really happen all that often in in fantasy books. And well, mm -hmm. uh, somebody commented underneath that post with the name Stephen Brust, and uh, well, you know me, Philippa. You don't know me all that well, Matthew. Yeah. And listeners, I like food. <laughs> I like to cook. I like to bake. I really like to eat. Okay. Uh, and like that, tasting tasty foods is one of my greatest joys in life. And during the mm -hmm. like okay. during the plague times, I was really worried I was going to get <laughs> the type of COVID that steals your sense of smell. Because oh, like, yeah. what would even be the point anymore if you couldn't taste what you were eating for like a year it's like that mm. luckily did not happen to me so yay but that that really you know it made me interested trying mm -hmm. to find out more and the Sounds recommendation great. doesn't lie like the food doesn't mm. appear as prominently as strongly in all of the books equally uh, mm. but it does play a role it appears in them and it will make you hungry while you're eating. It will make you like, yeah, okay. Uh, even if they're eating some strange animal that you haven't ever heard about, you're like, well, it's probably kind of like chicken, and you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, what do you think? Have I have I sold you on trying the books yet? I'm looking on all the book covers on all the series, yeah. and there is all kinds of creatures yes, on the books. I, I will get covers. to the creatures. And, uh, and now I'm thinking only about how they taste. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like it's you have successfully transformed the fantasy creature uh, gallery into a menu. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it sounds like an anime more than anything else. <laughs> Especially something looking like a bear werewolf. <laughs> speaking just now I see. it's uh-huh. uh, book 16 I was thinking book how six. this will taste so, uh, I, I don't know, that, that mean in book 16 it, 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 the, the covers they're, they're, they're not a menu, oh, yeah. I will get to what they what they mean, the creatures on okay, the covers okay, okay. Uh, soon <laughs> he's written a number of books, as you've said, and in my mm-hmm. opinion he is very good at what he does, he is a very good writer he knows his craft and his female characters while like the first book was published in the 80s and they're not as i would wish them ideally to be but they don't make me Hmm. want to tear my heart out in frustration Uh, Mm -hmm. we do see the women through the point of view of the point of view character which i think for a lot of the books i haven't read all of them is vlad He's a guy and, uh, you know, he's not perfect. So you do get some, uh, you know, less than ideal portrayals. But uh, it kind of always comes back to bite him in the ass because he's, you know, he makes assumptions and then they turn out to be wrong. Or he is blind to some aspect of the inner world of a female character. And then he's like, oh, yeah, that uh, I didn't even realize. And that was wrong of me so in that way it's it's not like breasting boo billy down the stairs uh, and <laughs> yes. that yeah. is the last time i mentioned that <laughs> sorry <laughs> <laughs> so i decided that i wouldn't spoil the story of the book for you i'll just introduce okay. you to the world and try to make you as excited about it as i am because i like i began to be very excited when i read the first line of the book of Jerek, there is a similarity, if I may be permitted an excursion into tenuous metaphor, between the feel of a chilly breeze and the feel of a knife's blade as either is laid across the back of the neck. I can call up memories of both if I work at it. The chilly breeze is invariably going to be um, the more pleasant memory. And like, that's a good beginning! Like, oh, like, that, yeah, that so. is excellent. From the first sentence, I'm like, oh, you get the sense of the tone of the book, the character of the person who's talking. And it's like, mm. it really whet my appetite to to find out more <laughs> about the person who's speaking. And uh, mm-hmm. the book doesn't have an omniscient narrator. The narrator is the point of view character who is, for many of the books, although not all of them, Vlad Daltos. And uh, Mm -hmm. through him, we experience the world. And uh, like all of us, he can be a short-sighted idiot, a prejudiced prick, (laughs) a brave person, a good selfless friend. uh, And But unlike most of us, uh, Vlad Teltos is an assassin. uh, And unlike all of us, he lives in a land called Dragara, populated by Dragarans Mm -hmm. who are for all intents and purposes, elves, and who see him, a human, an Easterner, uh, as Mm -hmm. you might some nasty little thing that got stuck to the bottom of your shoe. Uh, Yep, Bruce's elves are racist. (laughs) And before you go, like, I'm spoiling fantasy with politics, readers, because mm-hmm. I've, I've seen reactions like that in online spaces. <laughs> like, I urge you to shush and, and think for a moment. Uh, besides the fact that there's politics involved in every fucking thing ever that humans have ever created. Uh, like, like, think about it. These Dragarans, these elves, they live to be 3,000 years old. Easily. M- some mm-hmm. a lot more. And... Uh, they're uh and 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 like they're at least three feet taller than humans and the dragaran empire is not like a it's not misnamed it is an empire and the easterners are very much a minority so like it's like it kind of follows it's kind of logical right like the the dragarans were bound to be racist assholes to 
Easterners. Uh, an interesting thing, by the mm -hmm. way, is that uh, Vlad talks about Dragarans and then uh, sometimes Easterners and humans. But the Dragarans, they call themselves humans. And then, oh. like, the Easterners, they're, they're not human. They're, they're Easterners. Like, which I was like, hmm. that, that is logical, because, like, people usually consider themselves people and not, oh, we are the elves, right? Like, you know. <laughs> so I liked that. Like, but, but what is a human? You know? Yes. <laughs> uh, that's the thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Does, does this, like, kind of discrimination towards Easterners help Vlad in his in his career like in his assassin job is he kind of overlooked by the um, it uh, does it would other would people? help it affects every aspect of his life and it does mm -hmm. uh, it does help and hinder him equally uh, in his in his mm. profession so uh, they have it's an empire and it is ruled by an empress a phoenix empress who saved them all and brought their magic back and she's rumored to have an easterner lover but like does mm. she really oh, no. but like that that <laughs> doesn't stop the the racism and the discrimination because there are 17 houses capital h in dragara there's the phoenix the dragon leorn tiasa by the way i might be butchering the pronunciation of these That's things okay. because like yeah, I checked the guide but you know you're not really gonna re go back to the guide every time you see the word so mm -hmm. yeah uh, there's Hawk Zer which I think is the bear werewolf thing I'm not entirely sure though uh, yeah, yeah. Isola <laughs> Salmoth Valista Jerek uh, mm -hmm. Yorich Kreota yeah. Yendi Orca Tekla Jigala and Atira. Uh, 17 of them. Uh, like the number 17 is very important for Dragarans. And all of these houses are uh, involved in what they call the cycle, which is the succession in which the empire is ruled. Uh, so right now they mm. have an phoenix empress but when she dies or steps down uh the next the next ruler will be from the house dragon and uh each of these names is an animal in the world and they have some inherent characteristics uh these animals or it is believed that they do and uh, the dragarans believe that members of each house also share those characteristics so dragons are great fighters and technicians uh technicians tacticians not technicians <laughs> uh, <laughs> and the, the zur are also great fighters but a lot more ferocious and they core they care a lot more about their honor the Isola, mm. for example, they care about etiquette a lot. And mm -hmm. uh, all the noble houses look down on Jerek, uh, who in the book, the animal is like a small reptilian flying thing. Yeah. Uh, and the, the house Jerek, they take in mixed breeds, uh, m meaning like, uh, you know, individuals who aren't purely dragon and even Easterners. They take in even Easterners if they pay for a noble title. And the characteristic of the Jedek is that they are criminals and assassins. And it's like kind of the unspoken thing in the Empire. Like everybody knows what they do, but also it can't really be acknowledged because it's part of the way the Empire is run and money and... Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> It's essential. But like even the Jedek have another house to look down on, uh, which are the Tekla, the peasants and the farmers. So it's in the book. When you read it, you will notice it. Now is the reign of the Phoenix Empress. As I said, she saved the empire by entering the paths of the dead uh, where no living Dragaran is allowed to enter and leave and she brought forth the orb and thus sorcery after 500 dark years of the interregnum like I, I know what happened I won't spoil it for you what happened there was a dude 
he wanted a thing, he made a mistake, tragedy, sorcery, the, the orb was lost, sorcery was lost for, I think, 500 years, might, might actually be more, I'm not entirely sure. But the mm. Empress, she went, she got it, uh, she, sorcery is back, yay. <laughs> Vlad Taltosh is a baronet in the house of Jerek. He's also a, like low-level gangster, high-level gangster, depends which book you're reading, mm -hmm. and an assassin. He grew up in his father's restaurant where he wit witnessed his first assassination, which affected him quite deeply. But he never really connected with his father much, who did his best to kind of forget where they come from, that they are human. He tried to assimilate, pretend to be Dragaran, emulate Dragarans, and until at last he spent all his life savings to buy them a title in the Jedek. And thus they became citizens of the Empire. Easterners aren't citizens of the Empire. And uh, by becoming citizens, they have access to the sorcery of the orb. So he made uh, Vlad train in sorcery and also in the Dragaran style of sword fighting, which is quite absurd because they use like <laughs> massive swords. And he's like hmm. a reasonably tall guy for a human. But like Dragarans, they're seven feet, eight feet tall. So, you know. So wait, so are all Dragarans this yeah. strong, or is it just different breeds uh, of like the, Dragar, there's, the, They're not all houses? equally tall, they're not uh, all like, they, they don't all look the same, they're not all beautiful, uh, like like Tolkien yeah. elves, they just, you know, yeah, they are visibly different, taller, stronger, uh, so Vlad's dad tried to assimilate, and so Vlad always felt closer to his grandfather, who is very Eastern and very uninterested in confirming to the Dragaran standards. He taught him witchcraft, which the Dragarans cannot do. That is something that humans do. It's quite different. Like witchcraft is more oh, about ritual and intent and uh, like in the mind. And sorcery is more about having access to the to the orb basically and i don't it is explained in a way i don't really understand mm. it all that well i am not one of the characters in the book i don't think i have to <laughs> uh, so he taught him witchcraft and eastern sword fighting style with a rapier which is much more suited to who he is physically and also how to cook mm -hmm. eastern foods so it we're we're back with the with the food. <laughs> I was waiting for the food <laughs> yeah. to come. Up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, um, I was waiting for him to be a special cook or something. Uh, well, uh, he's not. Uh, like, <laughs> he, he cooks. I think he's quite pr proud of his skills, but it's it's okay. not like the end all and be all of the book. I was almost afraid that the magic system would involve uh, cooking delicious spells or something like that. <laughs> that, yeah, that would be, be awesome. very cool. <laughs> uh, I don't know how it would work, but it would yeah, be awesome. And uh, obvious question I have to mm -hmm. ask: I've been waiting if this comes up. Is he a vampire? Are there vampires? Why is he blood? <laughs> you do know that it's like a name, right? Yeah, like yeah, yeah. Vla Vladimir. Well, I just mean that that's what people would think of. If, his if full name is Vladimir Daltosh. His his grandfather yes, yes, calls yes, him Vladimir. Yes. <laughs> okay, okay. But for the English speaking readers, I imagine that they would immediately jump to the conclusion that this is about vampires. Well, they have to deal because, you know, we've read stuff about jacks and they're not all climbing beanstalks or ripping okay. prostitutes so. <laughs> okay 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 so i read that <laughs> Good point this is high fantasy with sci-fi underpinnings mm. what's the sci-fi sci uh, yeah. can you tell a little bit <laughs> I think it would spoil it a little bit for you if i told you yeah, the sci-fi so, underpinnings because it comes oh, up. aliens is what i'm asking yeah in a way yeah, oh, okay. but you'll have to wait Stop. until later because they, 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 it's the, it, it's more about how the their world was created and their society and like mm -hmm. where they the Dragarans come from, and I like I haven't yep. finished the series so I don't know all of it, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I'm still wondering how this all came to be. Like, how is there an explanation how Dragarans actually like evolved yeah. to be into these different kind of animals and different well, there, kind of branches? How yeah, is this? It, there, there is in a way that like it comes up na- naturally. Okay, hmm. you do get to find out. I'm very intrigued. How do you feel about seven, uh, six books? You said so. Are you very much excited to read the next six books? I, I am. Do you feel I, it a I bit am. burned I'll out? I am. I'll have or? to stop now because I I have to actually work on translating things. <laughs> 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 I was taking a long break from that, and now I have to mm-hmm. start again. So, but I I am you, you excited to find out more. Um, I'll just tell you how Vlad became an assassin, and then I'll recommend which book I think you might want to start with. Yeah, that was my last question. Exactly. <laughs> so Vlad's father dies because he catches some kind of a plague, and refuses to let the grandfather heal him with witchcraft. And they don't have mm-hmm. money for like a dragaran cure, so he just dies. And then Vlad uh, kind of falls into a life of crime as an enforcer for a small-time gangster, apparently with a heart of gold. Uh, And he gets himself a Jereg witch familiar uh, called Loyosh, Mm. who he can communicate with in his mind. Mm -hmm. And, uh, like, Loyosh is kind of fun. (laughs) He uses him in, (laughs) in his work. Uh, which is what assassination is called in the book. It's like mostly they refer to it as work. He's done work. <laughs> work. Yeah. Work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and later on, he kind, of, he kind of falls into becoming an assassin. He jumps at the opportunity to get paid to kill Dragarans, uh, who he kills. And he would love to kill them for free, but like, you know, he gets paid to do it. So that's an added bonus uh, and the story of Jereg starts with a member of the house Jereg one of the leaders in fact who calls himself the demon and no one actually knows his name or where he came from and this demon sets up a meeting with Vlad and commissions him to kill another highly placed Jereg who stole all of their money and ran off and they need the money back and they need him just gone. They need him obliterated mm. so that this never happens Out again. The because the House of Jedek is like made up of, of like crime lords. And if they find out that they can do this, that this is something they can get away with, like it's all over for the entire yeah. organization, capital O. And uh, mm-hmm. that's that's the that's the, what the story of Jedek is about. Yeah. So, which is the book you would say we should start with? I I thought about it, and I think you should start with Jedek. I think you should okay. start with that book because it's you you, you meet him for the first time. Vlad, mm. you find out about the world. This, like, it is a fun heist. This story is mm. a fun heist where they need to maneuver. At, at one point, it's like, okay, if we fuck this up, there'll be a <laughs> war. There'll be a civil war. And, like, like so yeah. many people will die. So we really can't make a mistake. And we need to kill this dude in, like this specific way (laughs) otherwise it's quite a problem and uh like it is a fun story and i think it's perfect for introducing you to to the character the next book is is the next book taltosh or not yet yendi Yendi. taltosh is four taltosh is four well in yendi taltosh meets his his wife and in Jereg, he, he already has a wife, and Yendi takes place before that. And you find out ah, how he okay. met his wife. And in Tekla, mm-hmm. you find out uh, why he should have been paying more attention to his wife. <laughs> Sounds uh, intriguing. But, right. like, if you want to, if after reading Jereg, you want to know more about the origins of him, I would recommend Taltosh and Dragon. 
So we'll see what happens. Will you read it? Yeah. Do you think? Yeah, I think about <laughs> it. I, I always have this difficult choice because uh, I don't want this podcast to die. And I want to read stuff that somebody reads with me. Mm. So it's already six books we can cover. You've already <laughs> read. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> I think that would get and like could... maybe boring after a while. But uh... it's a, it's a, that's like the question of a commitment because... I think on our podcast specifically, the sequels get much more interest than mm -hmm. the first books. And when we cover the whole series, I think that's like what people like that who listen. Like we covered oh. the, the Broken Earth trilogy and then the Three Body Problem trilogy and we're doing this Jade trilogy. So I think that's kind of like a thing I like the most about doing the podcast. I want to go through the whole series. But I don't know, I can do 17. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that long though it's like shorter books and also so. it would cover more than one year of the podcast <laughs> like, like, you're saying that as though it's that's a, a bad point. thing you said you you want the podcast to survive well yes yes do you think Martina you'd be up for it well I'd say like you had me at heist yeah. Christina like the moment you, you said heist uh, I, I, I mean... like heists too like that is like <laughs> fun things are happening yeah, the language aspect is the most uh, intriguing to me. Mm -hmm. I have to compare it to Neuromancer, where we discussed how the language is a huge deterrent, like we couldn't deal with mm. it. It was too red and cool, and it sounded super cool, mm. and then you were like, what happened? So here, <laughs> it sounds like it gives you a feeling, and it's for a purpose, so I appreciate it. So yeah, we'll see mm -hmm. what happens. I, I'm very interested. <laughs> And like, there's so many of the books, and they were published in the 80s, and I had never heard of the guy. Have you heard of him I'm before? I'm surprised it goes so far back, yeah. yeah. It looks like he takes his time. It's every few years another book. Uh, it's not like every single year another one comes out. Yeah, and and the nice thing is that I think he, he will finish it, unlike mm -hmm. uh, certain other authors <laughs> who, who write expensive <laughs> fantasy worlds. Uh, like, writing is a pain. But mm -hmm. also, you started the thing, you should either finish it or give your notes to somebody else to finish it for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's get into one more book, yes. but it will be quick. What is the book, Philip? <laughs> Tell us let's, about the book. Let's do this. <laughs> so, as you know, if you know me, I like weird stuff. And I have talked about uh, God Fight, the philosophy from a UFC MMA fighter on the catch-up episode. I've talked about Taken by the T-Rex, which is unfortunately dinosaur pornography. <laughs> and I have chosen another one. So as per tradition, I'll send you a photo of a guy who wrote this book. And have a look. Tell me what you see and what do you think this book is about. I have not chosen anything related to pornography nor fighting. And oh, I wait. have to say that I have enjoyed this book very much. <laughs> is he pretending to be a horse? Is he You're very is close? That the, is that the guy who's like lived among goats yes. for like one year? Or yes, was, that's was... it. <laughs> Do you oh, know this book? Oh my god! Tell me more. This is new for me. Tell me more. <laughs> I'll send you the book cover. This is a book I've heard of because of the Ig Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. And oh, also, yeah. also, I need to talk about Ig Nobel Prize if you don't know what it is. No, don't. So the book is called <laughs> uh, Goatman, <laughs> How I Took a Holiday from Being Human uh, by Thomas Thwaites. Uh, oh, like I like love that. how it, it took me a moment to figure out who who is the actual person in that picture. <laughs> no, but, but honestly, valid. Like, you know, imagine <laughs> yeah. you can take a year off of all of your human response. Haven't you ever looked at your pet and gone like, oh, I wish I had your life, you lucky bastard. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's true. That's very true. So, unfortunately, spoiler, he spent only a day as a goat. He spent oh. a lot of time researching and doing things and stuff like that. Oh, so, where's the commitment uh, in that? Yeah. <laughs> actually, no, that's a lie. He spent more than a, than a okay. day, but actually, like, being with ghosts, goats and proactively being goat-like, mm -hmm. uh, full-on was just one day. Ah. It was, like, the climax of the book. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, I've heard about this watching the Ig Nobel Prize ceremony. Uh, have you ever watched that, by the way? No. 
I did, yeah. yeah. <laughs> On your recommendation a while back. <laughs> did it, you like it? It was a... Yeah, it's fun. It's a lot of fun, but it gets old. By oh, okay. <laughs> like, if you watch too much, it gets old. But it's kind of fun to uh, to explore uh, the satire. It's if you've never heard of the Ig Nobel Prize, it's a delightful ceremony where they award uh, science uh, awards for something that makes you laugh, but then makes you think. And, yeah. Uh, <laughs> It's something that is amazing to me because there's always complete nonsense and then you learn something interesting and the ceremony involves a musical, uh, science demonstrations, Nobel laureates who are very lovely old people awarding Ig Nobel prizes to Ig Nobel laureates, <laughs> which is hilarious. There is a guy who is a literal spotlight painted in silver and pretending to be a spotlight while using the spot the, the light to do spotlights. It's, it's hilarious. It, like, it's, like, it's a like the nonsense. Pixar? <laughs> Guy? No, he's just no. a guy in the spandex in, in like a silver silver paint, mm-hmm. and he shines on people when they speak. But he's also the spotlight himself. It's it's all nonsense jokes like that, and the <laughs> awards they give are hilarious uh, because it's another Czech cast. I wanted to mention that twice the Czech Republic got the Ig Nobel Award or Czech Research Team. One time they got it for measuring people's brainwave patterns while chewing different flavors of gum. Oh. And the other time, which is much more romantic, they got it for research uh, on uh, new romantic par- partners and how their their heart rate synchronizes when they fall in love and how that actually happens. How do you actually <laughs> measure that? Yeah. Okay. But the funniest yeah. award <laughs> I've uh, heard is the Ig Nobel Prize for Peace was to the government of... I almost forgot the country. But they arrested a person for applause who had only one arm. What? And they arrested him for applause, but he had only one arm. <laughs> There's a whole news article about this, I can send you it. <laughs> Which country is it? <laughs> it's, it's like a whole story, I forgot the details, but it's hilarious. And they awarded the Nick Nobel Prize and they invited the, the president of the country, but he never arrived at first. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like, you can applaud by snapping your fingers or Belarus. something like that. Belarus. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah, I was just that, thinking that. That makes a that... lot of sense, <laughs> That <laughs> sounds very Soviet. <laughs> so... Oh, he was like, specifically arrested for clapping. Mm-hmm. Okay, then yes. that. <laughs> okay. That is very bizarre. Yeah, so uh, this guy, he was also, uh, I don't know if he was nominated or won the Nobel Prize, Ig Nobel Prize, but he wrote a book called The Toaster Project mm-hmm. on a heroic attempt to build a simple electro- electric appliance from scratch. And he built a toaster by smelting iron and like go- going to get copper from the mines and like building every single part and element and component from scratch. And it was kind of a famous book. Mm-hmm. He was very young doing it, so he got kind of famous. And his next project, I will be a goat. And he made this. So <laughs> I was very intrigued. So I was looking forward to read this book. I had it for a while. And finally, I have an excuse. So I finally read it. And it was... Uh, I got what I wanted. Uh, I would say this is very similar to something that Mr. Zibura writes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He's been famous recently in the Czech Republic. He writes... Uh, like travel diaries, junk travel diaries. <laughs> He's a yeah, he guy just, who has no money. Yeah, he just goes to a country, explores it on mm. foot. Usually he just backpacks around the country without knowing much about how to get or where to get to. And, you know, experiences what comes his way and then writes about it. Mm-hmm. And uh, usually there is a lot of hilarious stories coming out of it. So it's a fun read. He has a good way of putting a good amount of humor in his in his writing mm-hmm. and also good amount of actual like cultural experience so this book is not fiction uh, which is a rare thing on our podcast but it sounds like fiction <laughs> when you read it and it's uh, written like a build up to a story like what actually happens when he actually does it so in that sense it in that sense it keeps you going mm-hmm. and i was never bored and the only thing that's disappointing about the book is that he doesn't really succeed in most of the things he wanted to do. 
but at least he knows how they would have to be done. Yeah, so, so, so wait, what, what was it that he wanted to actually do? Like... So, so the premise is that he says in the beginning that many, many British, so he's a British guy, he was about 35 years old when he wrote this, and he said that he was very miserable, and uh, he says that many British people are very miserable. Let's look at the Queen, there is a photo of the Queen looking very miserable, and he compared <laughs> it to like, <laughs> it's like, he's making like stupid jokes, and at first it's very cheesy, But then he kind of gets to you and it's kind of funny, mm. makes me chuckle a few times. So he says, wouldn't it be nice to, you know, take a break from being a human? And then he says, if I actually were to do that, what would that entail? And which animal would I pick? Mm -hmm. And he starts by choosing an elephant. And he says, this is the most doable because it's a huge thing and I can pack everything inside of it. And we can like move the most similar and I don't have uh, a long neck. So I can pick that... up... I can pick up food with my trunk, so that's gonna be like an appendage that I can actually use to feed myself, because if I'm any other animal, I would have to like basically put my head to the ground to even pick stuff up, which I'm not able to, my neck's too short. So he starts, the book starts with research about him trying to become an elephant, and he gets a grant for it, for some organization, uh, actually, they pay him to do this research and become an elephant, and they go over a list of mechanical elephant <laughs> vehicles and constructions that people have created in the past which is hilarious i'll send you a photo and I, he talks I, about I how love, <laughs> i love christina's face right now <laughs> that's like you mean like he could be a baby elephant he could be a baby elephant yeah that's that's true his reasoning was that his body has to transform somehow to connect to some kind of contraption to become some kind of animal and if the animal is considerably bigger than him it will be easier to build it that's why he's considered or he could the be a massive mouse but, yeah. <laughs> but there comes so many problems <laughs> with making something so big exactly transporting it making it not break if he's there like on his own i assume <laughs> so So, okay, so because yeah, he, I guess it failed, right? Yeah, it failed immediately, <laughs> but because he's a guy like the Czech writer Zibura, he doesn't consider things and he just does them. So he already signed the papers and he got the grant and he already agreed that he would become an elephant, but immediately found out that it's not possible and he keeps saying that he doesn't want to involve any batteries, engine or propulsion or any mechanical energy system. So he wants to only sustain it himself with his own body. So that's elephant. why he cannot... Exactly. Yes. So he do he just doesn't do that, and then he has like a crisis, and a part of the book is him trying to find his his soul animal, and uh, he travels to Finland to meet a shaman, and <laughs> they do ritual dances together, and this lady tries to help him find his spirit animal. It's it's very funny, and he films her doing like ritual dances, and then she. Uh, tells him that he's completely idiotic and then he doesn't take anything seriously. She gets very offended, which I <laughs> like that the book is uh, kind of real about this yeah. because he's not hiding anything and he's not pretending anything. He's just saying as it was. And okay. she says that the, the lady was very offended that he pretended to be like a Finnish shaman who, who dances with animals or something. And she told him, okay, you're a dumb British guy, so you, as well, you might as well be a goat because that's the closest to who you are. And he's like, all right, that's it. That's well, how we chose the said it. Yeah, yeah and, and like, okay, I like that because I like. <laughs> of course, she was offended because he was an asshole mm -hmm. and kind of disrespecting yes, her yeah. entire culture. So yeah, yes, go and be a yes. go goat <laughs> asshole. <laughs> <laughs> and this this is like a theme uh, recurring throughout the book which I found very entertaining he always comes off as a complete idiot and offensive asshole mm -hmm. to scientists sh shamans people herding sheep and goats and all these people and he always somehow wins them over a little bit and they always try to like do stuff with mm -hmm. him so it's kind of lovable it's, it's kind of fun so he writes a reply to this to this grand company and he's like oh by the way I have just spoken with a shaman, and I'm not an elephant anymore. By the way, <laughs> is that okay? And the grand company <laughs> so says, fun. yes, of course. So after a while, they agree to change uh, for reasons. And the book is divided into five parts. There is the soul, uh, the mind, the body, the guts. And then basically he does the last part. I don't know what this calls it. Uh, action or something, I don't know. <laughs> So the soul, he just tries to find himself and see which animal he can spiritually follow, which was the goat. 
The second part he studies what capabilities a goat brain has. Uh-huh. And he finds that it doesn't have much. So he looks into a research how he could limit his brain brain functionality to become like a goat kind of. And he finds that goats don't see the future or past, like don't have memories much. They like don't have any language of course and all this. So he starts by uh, trying to block his ability to use the part of his brain for his speech. And he goes to a scientist and he <laughs> studies all this stuff. <laughs> and he says, I was waiting that yeah. like he goes to a shaman again. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> he actually goes to a person who does research about uh, like uh, brain injuries and using transcranial magnetic stimulation mm. to switch off parts of the brain. And he actually goes through the procedure to permanently block the language center of his brain so he can't stop, he cannot speak. That's like a whole part of the book about that. Permanently. T- temporarily, sorry. Temporarily, oh, okay. I mean to well, say. Okay. Well, okay. still, <laughs> like, can I just say, when you yeah, said it's a, it's the a lot fifth of part just of just the book, like... when you said you don't know what it's called, I I thought, wouldn't it be cool if it was called Meh? <laughs> <laughs> Probably would be the best, yes. <laughs> So at, <laughs> so at this point he he finds and this this is again a recurring theme like he goes to a scientist and he's like you have to do this and that and he's like you're, you're insane it's not possible and they they try to push it as far as possible and of course they find that without him having permanent side effects they cannot do this of oh, surprise of course so mm-hmm. he ponders about what it means and he has like a philosophical section in this chapter about philosophy and how people think and what it means and that was kind of boring and then he's like okay so i can't do anything to my brain but this is what it could be and that's kind of brushed off and he doesn't change his brain of course in any way to become a goat yeah so he goes to a shaman yeah. no he goes, <laughs> no he goes to so the next part is called body so he goes to a prosthetic company that makes prosthetics and specializes in building different kinds of prosthetics based on what body parts you're missing. And he has them design a goat exoskeleton and he keeps building on top of it and there is like a lot of uh, versions of it. I'll send you a photo of one of the one of the prototypes, which was kind of fun. So he goes through like five iterations of the goat prototype and the last one you saw on the book cover. Uh-huh. He learns how to uh, hop and skip and jump and all this. Uh, I've learned, for example, that the goat skeleton isn't connected by joints to its body. Like the legs aren't connected by joints, like by bones. Mm-hmm. So when a goat falls, the whole body bounces up and down on the muscle and doesn't break its legs because it's not yeah. connected to the legs by bone, which is why they can jump and fall so much. Which was interesting. So, yeah. Long story short, he makes a exoskeleton to move. Uh, next, he talks to like person who dissects animals. And tries to make an artificial stomach that would digest and ferment grass enough so he could actually eat it. And have some nutrition out of it. And he would like get that instead of his boring human stomach. Yes. I see. So he would somehow try to modify his stomach to be able to digest the grass. So he tries to find some... What about teeth? Is he going to go yeah, and get, get goat teeth? Yeah. No. Because like our teeth no, are he, not he made to that... eat grass. But he can yeah. eat grass with them, so that was good okay. enough for him. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so he somehow tricks a company that develops some kind of enzymes to break apart plants to send him like a barrel of it. Mm-hmm. And he wants to ingest it to change the bacteria in his guts to be able to digest. So, so wait, so he would like drink that before mm-hmm. and then he would like yes. eat the grass yes. and... Oh, okay. So he wanted to try to change the, his guts, like bacteria, to be able to break apart plants. But he, then he somehow suggests something similar to the company mm-hmm. that he got the enzyme from. And they're like, no, by no means, no, just, you will die. Just like, no, don't do any of this. You so he goes moron. through all these discussions. Then the the grand company finds out something about this. And they're like, oh, we didn't sign off for you to kill yourself. So please super confirm that you're not going to kill yourself. And also, by the way, 
uh, we have uh, changed the plan. How about you cross the Alps on, as, a, as a goat? And he's like, yeah, of course. And then <laughs> it continues. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. Could you manage to yeah, find yeah. out something about where he comes from? Because I'm thinking... He's British, but not exactly. You, you, have, you have to have a lot of money to do this kind of bullshit. Besides the grant. Because it takes that mindset, mm -hmm. I feel like. He says in the beginning of the book that he has plenty of money because yeah. of parents yeah. and stuff. And he's kind of feeling guilty about it. Yes. So he goes and becomes a, becomes a goat, uh, drinks exactly, uh, yes. enzyme, digests sure parents are proud. <laughs> so, sorry, please continue. What happens next? Yeah, it's okay, it's okay. He, he makes a device that... If you really, really press pressurize uh, like the grass, and then you change the pressure like really abruptly, and you add some chemicals, then it breaks it apart, and some sugars come out of it. That's like a thing that he plans. So he uh, plans to have a sack that he will spit into the whole day and not eat, and then in the evening he has this pressurized super cooking pot, and he will empty the sack into the pot and super pressurize it and then drop the pressure abruptly and cool it, add the chemicals and that should produce some sugars which will sustain his life. <laughs> I'm sorry, is this all just to be a goat for one day? Or was his plan to be like a goat for uh, forever? His plan was to be a goat for a while. He never said how long. Uh, but <sighs> it ended up being just a day, unfortunately, but yes. I well, I I I don't personally know anybody who's a furry, but I think <laughs> that they uh, they have the right idea. They have the right idea. You want you want to be an animal, you go and you put on a fur suit and you play around. You don't spit in a sack all day. <laughs> and then pressurize it and drinking as some disgusting saliva grass smoothie. Jesus fucking Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Topic of sex comes up because goats have lots of sex and he's like talking about it and what it entails and what it will mean. And then he, of course, comes to the conclusion that it's not a question of would he do it, but it's a question of could he and what would the repercussions of that be so he doesn't want to do it so he picks a season where goats don't mate and Jesus he does it during that season Christ. but he says that the grant would probably be cancelled and people wouldn't be very interested in his book afterwards so that's his reasoning why he wouldn't that, go that way good call don't go yeah. fucking goats man and his friends told him that exactly yes <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so it's a w wisdom right there. Yeah. Exactly. You don't even need a shaman for that. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> so then it all comes together. Uh, and he is planning to find. We skipped like the goat dissection part and how he was trying to steal a goal, goat carcass so he can dissect it. And he's, there's a bunch of <laughs> escapades. But to, to skip to the end, he has to find uh, the perfect place to become the goat. And he finds a place in Swiss Alps where... Goats are the happiest, and he goes there with his friend and his filming crew, and he has all this large luggage where he's trying to hide his goat stuff because he didn't tell the people that he's going to be a goat uh, because they wouldn't agree to let him go there. So he's trying to pretend to be a journalist and take photos of goats or something and just get them to the farm first and then see what happens because he is sure that if he told them what the plan is, they would so not let no, him. He'll so fuck he got... our goats, keep him away. <laughs> <laughs> so he ke keeps uh, going higher and higher in the mountains and there are less and less roads so he says to start walking and they keep dragging around all this luggage and they can't go any further and then they have to climb like this steep incline to get to the goat farm which is really really high up in the Alps and he can't do it anymore so they find some help and they uh, find like a lift where they tie out the luggage to a rope and then they pull it up on a rope on the on the mountainside. But just getting there without the luggage almost killed them. So they're already dead. And the guy who is Swiss doesn't speak English too well. And now is the time to break it to him what the plan was, <laughs> which was very amusing in the book. 
So they go through some discussions and he keeps like one-upping himself and suggesting what could happen. And they have dinner and he's like, yeah, so I, I really enjoy like really being the moment and really like going up close to the goats. Would it be okay if I got in between the goats to, to like experience it firsthand and like stuff? And the guy was like, why not? I don't care. And he just keeps saying more and more and more. And at one point... Uh, he breaks it to him and he says, yeah, I have this costume and I want to be like a goat in your herd and I want to do it like for a while. And he, the guy has a huge beard and he's kind of old with his wife sitting there and <laughs> just, just stops talking. Doesn't say anything for like a few minutes. And then, <laughs> then he has like a huge sigh or something. And he says, okay, if you're going to do it, you're going to do it tomorrow. You're going to get up at 5 a.m. There's no delaying. I'm not going to take any care of you. You do whatever you like, but you have to leave at 5. So you better be there and goodbye. And he leaves. <laughs> I like this guy. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, my God. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's your life. Life, mate. And he also tells him that he'd better leave even earlier because the herd of goats running downhill might be a little <laughs> bit dangerous while he's in the middle, middle of that. And the mm. problem with that is that the whole incline that they uh, climbed the day before, they have to go down because the grass where they go to yep. feed is down under the hill. And then yeah. they have to go run back up, which he almost <laughs> died walking and now he has to do yep. it in the suit. So in this exoskeleton nonsense thing. So he puts it on in the morning and he heads out one hour in front of the goats and he's like hopping down the mountain in this thing and he finds immediately it's impossible because he, the the prosthetics, they warned him in the in the clinic that it might be painful and they don't think it's doable. I'm sorry, did he not test this before? He did, he did, he did. He did test it a bunch. But he didn't okay. test it on, like, you know, going down a mountain, which is... Like, that's the first thing you should test it on. Like, <laughs> you're going to be on a mountain, so test it on a hill I at least or something. I am shocked that it is unpleasant physically to be walking yes. oh my God. down a mountain in a goat skeleton thing on all fours. Like, like is it really? I, I wonder who could have <laughs> predicted that. <laughs> <laughs> so he the tenth of the way progress in the one hour to, to the to grass fields the goats start running he's freaking out the, the, the farmer just try not, not watch it because he doesn't care so he manages to like fall on the side and the goats fall like on him and over him but they don't kill him and they run away and he's just slowly walking to catch up with the goats Aww. and he arrives maybe six hours later after the goats to the <laughs> pasture <laughs> And uh, he's completely destroyed, but I have to admire his determination. He didn't take it off. He did make it all yeah. the way with this thing he built. And now he's the time to be happy as a goat. So he goes in between the goats, starts eating the grass and spitting it in his bag. And he like bumps into the goats and some goats go closer and like say hi and all this. It's like a whole part of this book. At one point he accidentally makes it a little too high and... By accident, challenges the herd by being the leader because he's the highest on top of the hill above the goats. And all the goats like stop and watch him. It's a very dramatic moment. But then his goat, that is his best friend who he's been following, steps in and saves him by standing in front of him and then going a little bit higher above him. So he's not now the challenger goat. And he's very grateful for that. And yeah, stuff like that happens. So after the whole day of eating and spitting, he goes to his cooker and spits it all in the cooker and cooks it. With his little that, hoofs. Yes. He says that uh, he's dying from starvation, but it's okay. And he has to... He's, he didn't eat for yeah, one day. Course, like, what the... <laughs> okay. like you'd, so you'd he... be hungry, but also, of course, you would. Yeah. You yeah, are, you're fine. Um... You're okay. Like You, you don't have to eat <laughs> that much. So just to prove his point... He cooks the grass in the pressurized thing, then he depressurizes it, does all this stuff. He uh, has all kinds of jokes, like the system says that it should never be close to fire because it's highly pressurized. So he puts it on the fire to heat it up and all this crap, but mm -hmm. it's just for like a bad joke. And then he says it looks brown, which if there were sugars in it, it should be brown. Mm -hmm. So that means there are some sugars, so he eats it. He says it's tastes like burnt corn, I forgot. But basically he ate it and he didn't get sick. He goes back to the farm, 
all the way back up the mountain. He gives up. He doesn't do it as a goat, which I was very disappointed. <laughs> and that's basically it. The farmer, the next morning, he goes out again with the goats. And the farmer is very amused that he actually did it. So he puts a bell around his neck. And he, like, officially makes him join the herd in the morning again. So they stay at the farm a bit. And then the very ending of the book is a giant cop-out, which I was very disappointed about. Because he has to go across the Alps as a goat. So they yeah. do do that. But he doesn't talk about it at all. And he doesn't talk to, in, to any detail. And he just said, yeah, we took some pictures in the Alps with the thing. So they probably didn't do anything. But the shame that he didn't say what actually happened. Goats can be passengers in cars. True. Yeah, you know, true. that is a solution. <laughs> yep. I guess like, he had obligations to the company, of, which gave him the grant, maybe. So like, he had to do it. But there also weren't any details how he should be doing it. So he had to find a loophole. Yeah, it was 200 pages, came out 2016, and I was very entertained. I don't I don't regret reading this, it was fun. That's the book. I would recommend it, even though I spell, spoiled it. I, I was thinking I, I would say, like, I, I recommend it. It's also fun, if you're curious what happens, just read it, by. But I'm sure nobody would ever read this, so now you know what actually happens, at least. I, I, <laughs> I feel dislike towards this person. I'm sure you would hate him, yes. It's like... It makes me a little depressed to, to, to know... <laughs> oh, sorry. To know that... Uh, it's like, is the main character, isn't he? I think we know people yeah, yeah. like that who are the main character in the story of mm-hmm. the world. Yeah, and exactly. I just... I don't think he came off as being an asshole. I think he was no. kind of humble about it and he was trying to make it funny. And he says himself that he feels very guilty about the situation he's in and what he's doing, but he does it anyway. So, yeah, uh, yes, yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. But he at least is not in your face about okay, it. Okay, okay. I gotta give him credit. If he was, like, honest about all the things he did in the book, didn't try to pretend mm-hmm. anything else that didn't happen, maybe uh, except the ending, which was kind of vague, as you said. Mm-hmm. I-, I kind of see that... This is a nice experiment to do. Yeah, you have the money, you have the resources, and you have the time to do it. Why not? Like, you're not, right. Yeah. you're not, you know, preventing someone else from doing something. So, yeah, it's your I... life. So, it's nice to kind of document that mm. way, because uh, let's be, cl- like, let's be honest, nobody else is going to do this <laughs> in their life, probably. So, I... like, yeah, uh, why I, I not? I feel kind of bad mm. for all the people that, because, like, he... Apparently, he spoke to a lot of scientists, researchers, professionals, and, scientists, and professionals, yes. and it it feels a little bit like wasting their time. Like, yes, well, they no. probably they probably were compensated for it, and they probably had a lot of good time trying to like research this Maybe, kind of stuff as well. I don't because know. scientists love projects. Scientists love you know mm-hmm. kind of solving that sense, problems that's why that I like are. It. I, I think it's. From a researcher's point of view, I would be kind of happy to try to mm. like help out this person. And all the people he met seemed happy. Like that's what I was trying to say. Like for example, the guy from the prosthetics clinics, they were really interested in the challenges mm. it takes to make this thing comfortable and what this body will how it body will react and how they will build this and that. And they all were had the same reaction. They thought he was a complete asshole and then they kind of it kind of grew on them and they got something out of it. For the research, like Martin's saying, so it was kind of nice in that sense. And can any of what has been discovered through his efforts be applicable to further the f- uh, the study of the field and, and yeah, actually be be helpful to to people? Because yeah, like no. I would be like, okay, no, of course, valid. Not. They they found some stuff out. I, like I am they not might a have scientist, done something accidentally, but... so I can only put myself <laughs> into the mind of the person who has the goats, the the Swiss with the beard and the goats and if somebody did that i met somebody who wanted me to accept him into the herd i'd be like fuck off and also (laughs) okay i guess do whatever the fuck you want you he just didn't say it he was just silent for a while i think yeah (laughs) yeah yeah 
So I think as a book, it's it's not bad. And as a, is it justified to do that? I agree with what you're saying completely. But I, I like to, you know, learn about these things. It's it's fun to me too. So. Rich people do it's a fun read. like many stupider things. So at least he is entertaining. Every time Paul is on our catch-up episode, he says that he lost respect in me by 10-20 points every time I mention a book. So I hope you haven't lost more respect, Paul, if you are listening. And uh, please tune in to our next catch-up episode where I have another book ready that's completely different from anything I've mentioned so far. So... Your variety in book choice on these <laughs> <laughs> on these catch-up episodes think... is amazing so far. I think we should... So I'm definitely looking forward to the next one. <laughs> Thank you. I think we should end the the episode uh, with various goat noses. What do you think? <laughs> Before we do, I want to say I'll put a poll on Spotify. I've been doing that recently. Tell us if you want us to read. What are, what what do you want us to read next? I'll put up the book of Jeheregedreheg, and if you want more <laughs> stuff like that. Uh, yeah, so just also, check out the of poll. course, one of the options should be just goat sound, you know, okay. just goats. Yeah, but then okay. everybody will that. click on the goat sound and Philip will not That's find okay. out That's anything. No problem. <laughs> we will have to find out what it means. And also let us know in the comments if you want some non-fiction books on this podcast, because we never do those. About the murder in Rome that I recommended yes, you. Yes, I wanted to read That could yeah. be cool. Coming up, possibly realistic depictions of <laughs> Rome murders. <laughs> like <laughs> true, true, true crime, accurate. true crime story? No, yeah, like, like about it's just the, history, the, but... the concept of murder and uh, in, in, in ancient Rome and ah, crime okay. and like what was murder, what wasn't murder and... Yeah, I want to read it. It sounds really fun. That does sound intriguing. Uh, it has yeah. a cool name. Peculiar thing happened on the way to the forum, or a funny thing happened. Something like that, yes. Uh, on the way to the forum. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like something from Monty no. I think Python I think it's a quote like... <laughs> from Julius Caesar. Oh, okay. In which case, it probably won't be funny, but uh, something thing happened on yeah, the way yeah. to the forum. <laughs> so thanks for listening, and. <laughs> <laughs> Vote for this goat nuts can... on the next Spotify poll. Meh. <laughs> 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 <laughs>